Thank you for downloading this podcast. You'll be listening to E. Jim G. Ross. He will be giving the foundation lectures. This is lecture number one, the foundation lectures for Gnosis. And let's begin. So, good evening, good night, good morning, good afternoon. Whatever you're listening to this uh, lecture about Gnosticism, about Gnosis, have you heard that word before? It is within the word diagnosis. Maybe you've heard about the Gnostic Gospels discovered in 1945 in Egypt. They are Gospels of disciple of Jesus Christ, which are not in the Bible. What about the Dead Sea Scrolls? They are also connected with the Gnostic Gospels, discovered in, at the end of the 1800s. There you will find the Gospel of Mary Magdalene and also the Gospel of um, one of the disciples that was accused of being a traitor to Jesus Christ. But this disciple explains in this uh, scroll, in this uh, gospel, Gnostic gospel, he was never a traitor to Jesus. His name is Jesus, Judas Iscariot. Now, about all of this, we'll be talking for the next few weeks and months and even years if you are willing to listen more and more and more. So we are connected with Gnostic institutions all over the world, in all continents, and we feel that humanity should have more access to this information because it is needed. You know, we have to accept that our entire human race is in troubles. Recently, we had the collapse of the economy worldwide. It affected all of us, business people, big corporations, medium, small corporations. What about the workers, the entire human race? Most of people make a living out of a salary. Well, we were all affected. Why is that? Why is that happening? What about earthquakes, tsunamis, global catastrophes? happening everywhere. There was an 8.8 earthquake in Chile recently, February, at the end of February, February 27th, if I'm not wrong. 8.8 earthquake, stronger than the earthquake in Haiti. In Haiti, 200,000 plus people died. In Chile, not even a thousand died because they were prepared for earthquakes. Well, what is happening really? What about global warming? What is that? You see, there are so many questions that are not really answered properly. The time has come to rediscover ourselves. You see, when we say, for example, this is a question that we all ask ourselves sooner or later. Who am I? Who are we? Do we know? Do we really know who we are? Are you sure about that? Doesn't it happen that sometimes we surprise ourselves? We thought that we would never be able to do this or that. But in reality, we surprise ourselves. We discover an incredible potential that we never realized. We had it sleeping within ourselves. So this is all Gnosis. Gnosis means knowledge coming from ancient Greek, you know, ancient Greek mythology. I wouldn't call it mythology. I would call it the ancient religion. That was more than a religion. It was, you know, the foundation of an entire society. The Greeks, the ancient Greeks that lived before Jesus Christ, they learned from an incredible civilization that existed before than them, the ancient Egyptians. The mystery of the pyramids is still a puzzle for scientists and the entire human race. We, we try to give explanation, but in reality, we're always short about explaining the mystery of the Egyptian pyramids. What about the Aztecs 
and Mayan pyramids in Mexico? What about the Peruvian pyramids, the Incas in Peru? You see, they are all mysteries. So it's very important that we, through Gnosis, we can explore our world from a scientific point of view, from a philosophical point of view, from an artistic point of view, and also from a mystical, or I would say religious also point of view. We study all religions, comparative religious studies. So when we study, you know, ourselves, when we try to discover who am I, who are we, who are you, who are, do you know who you are? Do we know who we are? You know, the ancient Greeks used to say, you know, they wrote in a temple at the entrance of that temple, and you can still read it. Oh man, woman also, know yourself and you will know the gods and the universe. What is that? Is it that the universe is inside of us? Uh, are we a perfect representation of the universe? Is it possible that our atomic particles correspond to every solar system, every planet of the galaxy where we live? Is it possible? Why not? You know, these are answers and questions that we should, you know, be able to answer and to question and question and question in a few words to fall in love with knowledge. And Gnosis means knowledge, knowing from moment to moment. Do you remember when you were a child, you were learning to walk, you were learning to speak? Can you remember that part of your life? A very real, you know, experience that we all had. Do you remember that we were bombarding our parents or our elder people, members of the family or whatever, bombarding them with questions. We wanted to know everything. Well, at that time, we were hungry and thirsty for knowledge, which is gnosis, gnosis. We wanted to know everything. Is there anything wrong with it? The answer is no. There is nothing wrong. At the contrary, what happened? Our parents or our grown-up people that we were in touch with, told us to go to play with the other children. They were too busy to answer our questions. So what happened? We got disenchanted with that situation, and instead of continuing bombarding people with questions, we walk away from knowledge, from knowing. We were already learning to be in love to fall in love with knowledge, you know, and suddenly we walk away from it. You know, that's the difference between excellence and mediocrity. When you are in love with knowledge, you want to know everything, you become a leader. That is a psychology of a leader. You continue learning no matter what. When you walk away from knowledge, when you don't want to know anymore, you become a follower. So, are we all designed to become leaders? The answer is yes. You know, when you, especially when we learn to become leaders of ourselves. So who am I? Who are we? Do we know who we are? We are, according to Gnosticism, according to Gnostic anthropology, according to Gnostic psychology and philosophy, we are all spiritual beings, immortal spiritual beings. We have a body, we have a mind, we have emotion, we have instinct, we have a sexual life, we have a soul. But who are really, who we, who we are, who are we? We are a spiritual beings, immortal spiritual beings. So to understand all of that better, we need to immerse within science, philosophy, art, and mysticism. This is Gnostic anthropology. Gnostic anthropology, different than the anthropology that we learn in universities or in colleges 
or even in high school. The problem with our anthropology today is not anthropology anymore. It's actually when you learn to do excavations. It's archaeology, an aspect of anthropology. But anthropology is much bigger than that, much wider than that. You know, anthropology is science, philosophy, art, and religions, all religions of the universe. So this is why the purpose of our lecture will be to learn Gnostic anthropology, to learn Gnosis, and to learn also a more complete anthropology, different than the one we have learned in universities or in colleges or in private institutions, etc. The problem again, when people study theology, you know, they immerse within the study of the spirit, but they learn nothing about matter. You see, or people who study materialistic philosophies, they immerse within materialistic conceptions of the universe. And at the end, what do we get? An incomplete perception of reality. In Gnostic anthropology, we study spirit and matter. We even are more courageous when we say the spirit is the masculine aspect of life and matter is the feminine aspect. We could say that the spirit descended from a spiritual universe, a universe made of pure light called the absolute in many ancient religions, and the spirit descended, created the universe, created matter, and made matter, you know, the wife of the spirit, and the universe appeared, manifested. So the universe became pregnant with life, and here we are. There is an ancient, you know, esoteric axioma that says, what's above is below, what's below is above. So I would experience it here on earth when we need a man and a woman to procreate life. Well, that's exactly what happens in the universe. The macro universe and the micro universe. So essentially, when we say that we are the galaxy, we're not, you know, speculating. The entire galaxy is within ourselves. The problem is we need to do some work to be able to incarnate the aspects of the galaxy. Superior beings have done that work. You know, superior beings like Jesus Christ, Moses, Buddha, Krishna, you know, Hermes Trismegistus from ancient Egypt, etc., etc. Wiracocha in ancient Peru, Quetzalcoatl in ancient Mexico. They are all superior individuals that incarnated aspects of the universe. They became, we could say, solar people. They incarnated aspects of the sun, all suns, or one sun or many suns. What about the immense majority of people? We could say that we are lunar, lunar people. So the purpose of life is to learn to transform the moon into a sun. In a few words, we are made from atoms from the moon. So the time has come to learn to transform those atoms, those atomic particles, in particles connected with the sun, to become solar people instead of lunar people. That's also connected with our psychology, you know. But let's put some order into this, okay, because we are going in different directions, and it's very important, again, to understand Gnostic anthropology. Now, what about science? You know, science. Are we really scientists when we say we are? You know, the situation is science doesn't consider inspiration, imagination, and intuition as part of a scientific method to perceive reality. They only talk about logic, thinking. 
what, what is that, you know? The inductive and the deductive way to perceive reality. And what happened, you know? What about, you know, medicine? Laboratories, every three years, every five years, they have to replace their medicine. Why? Because their inductive and their deductive method to perceive the cure for that specific illness didn't work. So what is the scientific approach into reality? Come on, you know, what is science? Science means the study of the phenomenon of nature and when the repetition of the phenomenon is continued, then we discover a law. Are we really applying cosmic laws into medicine? Or are we applying, you know, uh, an incomplete perception of the reality? You know, I remember ancient doctors, actually the founders of medicine coming from Greece, you know, ancient Greece, they, they had a total different approach into perceiving an illness. You know, they were using also intuition. They were using inspiration, imagination, because they are all superior senses that we all have within ourselves. Albert Einstein considered the man of the millennium. This is important to be remembered. Albert Einstein said, science without religion, lames. Religion without science is blind. So that means we need both. We need to marry, marry science and religion again, the way it used to be. Because when you are a religious individual, a serious religious individual, you study the spirit. You immerse within the study of the divinity, connected with superior senses. And when you study matter, of course, you study what you can see, what you can verify. But you know, today the concept of matter has expanded. Albert Einstein discovered the fourth dimension. You know, and he also said there is a fifth dimension, there is a sixth dimension, there is a seventh dimension. Albert Einstein discovered, do you know what he discovered? He discovered the electronic the electronic universe. We can say the ether, the ether of the universe, which is connected today with computers, connected with cell phones, television, radio waves, which is the bridge, listen to this carefully, this is the bridge between cells, human cells and the cells of the universe, and molecules, is the magnetic field that connects cells and molecules. And this is the fourth dimension. The fourth dimension. We enter already the fourth dimension scientifically. We have products that can be created based on the fourth dimension. He discovered the relativity of time and space, but also he opened the door to explore the fifth dimension, which is the molecular universe. Did you know that cancer is a molecular virus? Did you know that? Well, scientists prefer not to talk about that. We do it. We do it because we have our ways of exploring also the universe. You know, we respect Albert Einstein. He's a, a true scientist, a man who opened the door for many avenues to be explored. What about the atomic particles? That's also connected with the parallel universes. And this is all matter, matter. Energy is matter. What about the spirit? Well, the spirit is higher than matter and energy. The spirit is light, pure light, pure light. So the sunlight is a spiritual force. And the sun itself, matter and energy, is the physical body of the spirit. You see, but without matter, the spirit wouldn't be able to manifest. It's like a child cannot manifest without the mother. So the word matter, matter in Latin means mother, 
the mother of the universe. So those materialistic philosophies are really twisted based on ignorance and arrogance because in reality, you know, they don't see the feminine aspect of the divinity. The word God, God is coming from Latin Deus, that means dos in Spanish. Deus means also two, number two, which is the spirit and matter. Both are God. So superior beings, higher than we are, and this is what the ancient Greeks used to say, you know, know yourself and you will know the gods and the universe. Who are the ancient gods? Well, the same angels, archangels, seraphims, you know, thrones, etc., etc. Christianity speaks about them, describes them. Jewish religion, there is no difference now, these superior individuals, they have learned to incarnate the spirit. In a few words, they have learned to crystallize the spirit and they have learned to materialize, I'm sorry, to crystallize the spirit and to spiritualize matter. You know what that means? So then, when you spiritualize matter and crystallize the spirit, you become one. The spirit and matter are not separated anymore. They become a unity. And when you do that, of course, you get closer to the divinity. You get closer to God. You become a sacred individual. Do we all have the potential to get there? The answer is yes. Do we like it? Maybe we are afraid of thinking about it. Don't be afraid. Fear is coming from what? Fear is the perception of the unknown. How do we eliminate fear? Transforming the unknown into known. And this is gnosis. Knowledge. Don't be afraid of knowledge. That's the only way to grow psychologically and even physically. Even physically, because we can eliminate you know, illness, if we know how to cure ourselves, if we understand the, you know, what are the illnesses coming from, the cause of illness. So we will have a long journey together if you are willing to be with us. It will be our pleasure, our honor, our duty, our responsibility to share with you whatever we have learned from Gnosis, Gnosticism, from the Gnostic Gospels found it in the Dead Sea Scrolls in the 1800s, from the Gnostic Gospel found in 1945, which are Gospels written by disciples of Jesus Christ which are not in the Bible. That expand, listen to this carefully, this material expands the perception of Christianity. So, do you know what we learn from it? Maybe you won't like what I'm going to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. All religions are good. Why? Because all religions teach the same principles. Exactly the same principle. There is no difference. Don't confuse principles with institutions. The problem is the institutions through human history, they have forgotten their own principles. And when people say, my religion is better than yours, they are wrong. They are wrong. Because all religions are precious pearls within the necklace of the divinity. They were all given to us by the divinity. Messengers of God descended from the superior universes, superior dimensions of space, angels, archangels, etc. The Elohim reincarnated to help us, to give us all different religions. The problem is us, we lunar people, we have, you know, forgotten our own religions because we don't practice it. <laughs> people say, I'm a Christian, I'm a Catholic. Are you sure? Are you? I'm a Jewish. Are you sure you're a Jewish? You know, people say, I'm a Muslim. There is a big conflict right now because they accuse them of being terrorists, which is also wrong. 
If you study their sacred books, you know, they are far away from being terrorists. What about the Hindu religion? What about, you know, the Buddhist religion? The Dalai Lama, you know, is a living proof that Buddhism is an amazing religion. Buddhism is actually, you know, the fusion of two ancient religions, the Hindu and the ancient Tao religion coming from ancient China. So Buddhism is a beautiful religion. Now, we were talking about science. Okay, as, as we said, science without religion lames, religion without science is blind, so we need both to understand, to develop, to expand the scientific, you know, real method, a superior kind of method to apply a scientific, you know, perception of reality. What about philosophy? You know, who are we? Who am I? This is an important question. Uh, we gave already the answer. We are spiritual beings. We have a body. We have a mind. We have a soul. Now, where are we coming from? Well, the answer is all religions do agree with that. We are coming from the absolute. Einstein never said that the absolute didn't exist. He said time, only time and space. Time and space are relative. He never said the spirit is relative. Never said that. He practiced the Jewish religion, Albert Einstein. So we are all coming from the absolute. What is, what is the absolute? Is the spiritual universe. The absolute, you know, represents the increated, increated universe. It means the spirit has always been. It will always be. It will never die because it were never born. And this is something that our, our little brains will never be able to understand because the brain is designed to understand everything has a beginning, everything has an end. And this is wrong. The spirit has no beginning, has no end. It means that all of us, without exception, has no beginning, has no end. Who saw, what suffered transformations is our body, our mind, our soul, you see, because they are matter. They are, they are the vehicles, vehicles of the spirit to manifest in the physical universe and also all parallel universes connected with matter and energy. So basically, what are we doing here? Another philosophical question. What is the purpose of life? Well, the purpose of life is what? Isn't it to grow, not only physically, to grow psychologically, psychologically, to grow in our mind, our emotions, our soul. Soul means consciousness. Are we conscious or are we unconscious? The answer is we are conscious a tiny little bit. We're very much unconscious. What is consciousness again? Soul. What is unconsciousness then? Ego, ego, ego. The egotistic perception of reality is subconsciousness. So, what is the purpose of life? To eliminate the ego, the me, 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 the psychology of me first, me second, me third, and I don't care about anybody else. We could also say that's the animal psychology. Based on fear, because of a lack of knowledge. You see, so when we learn to know, we lose fear and also we eliminate the ego. We become conscious. Conscious. And, and this is extremely important to transform our psychological way of perceiving reality. Learning to fall in love with knowledge. Learning to fall in love, you know, with wisdom. Because the word philosophy means falling in love with wisdom. Being in love with wisdom. This is the meaning of the word philosophy. Now, 
So we are here to awaken our consciousness, which is sleeping within the ego. Now, psychologists and psychiatrists from university, they teach that we need the ego. With all respect, we disagree with them. We don't need the ego. They say to survive, wrong. If you are conscious about reality, you survive better than those who have too much fear because everything is coming from fear. You know, either we have a wimpy psychology or we are courageous. We have to learn to be courageous. When you are a leader, you are courageous. When you are a follower, you live in constant fear. And this is one of the causes of illness, fear, ignorance. Now, where are we going? Well, at the end of the planet Earth, we will return to the Absolute. We descended from there. We can say we are a tiny little spark that lives in our heart. That spark, you know, is our divine spirit. We could say we are a baby spirit. But also, when we compare ourselves with an angel, with a superior being, you know, these superior individuals, they are not a spark anymore. They are a flame. It means they have learned to illuminate themselves. So the entire human body becomes a flame. Different degrees of flame, of course. So what's the purpose of life then? To transform from a tiny little spark that lives in our heart. We can say it's a divine atom, a master atom that lives in our heart, our real being, a little piece of God, a little piece of the divinity. So, if we learn to transform into a flame, we have fulfilled the purpose of light, life. You see, and this is interesting to be comprehended, understood, discussed, analyzed, etc., etc., meditated. So, we are here to fulfill a purpose. We have a mission, we all have a mission to learn to transform ourselves to incarnate more and more aspects of the divinity because in reality the spirit doesn't evolve. What evolves is matter and energy. But the spirit, you know, is the universal spirit of life. When you become a superior being, an angel, a master, we incarnate higher and higher aspects of the universal spirit of life. But the spirit doesn't evolve. It's important to understand that. So, what about art? There is a Gnostic art, different than the art just to make money, you see. And this is why today, in our modern times, this column, you know, this ancient column of art, of the Gnostic anthropology, has become so much twisted and manipulated, you know, going in the wrong direction. This is why our poor artistic world is in trouble, you know, because we had made of the arts not a real search for beauty and perfection, but just, you know, a way to, you know, to make the ego stronger, to make our you see, to make our un unconsciousness stronger, to develop the animal psychology stronger, and to never learn to become real humans. You know, there is a divine art. You know, can somebody who paints, can represent a sunset with the kind of perfection that we can see with our own eyes? Can we represent a sunrise? you see, with that beauty and perfection. I remember I was driving all the way from Canada to, to the U.S., and I saw, I witnessed, you know, some beautiful rocks, mountains. And I, I was so impressed because some of those rocks, they look like somebody cut them with a perfect, powerful knife. You know, they're the level of perfection of that cat was so incredible and they were heavy rock, rocks, you know. 
And who did that? Mother Nature did it through rain, through wind, and also time. It was incredible. The beauty and perfection that you can see in nature is not very easy to be able to represent the way we do it. So this is art. What about music? You know, if we study Beethoven and Mozart, you know, it's already proven scientifically. You put Beethoven and music, you know, in, in, a, in a country, you know, where people have the business of, you know, uh, milk or eggs. And it's already proven that chicken will develop bigger eggs and the milk will be more powerful, more substantial, more, you know, healthier, much more healthier than when they don't put, you know, this classical music. Also, if you put classical music in an apartment or in a house with plant, inside plants, they grow beautifully. If you put rock music, especially that heavy metal rock music, you kill the plants. The sound, the vibration, you know, is also important. Is it a superior sound or is it an inferior sound, you know? These are all aspects of scientific aspect connected with the arts, music, the power of music, etc., etc., you know? So then, comparative religions, we tell our students to study all religions. We will give you a lot of information, you know, if we continue with these lectures. We will give you a lot of information about all religions. And you will find the connection between them all. They are all, they are all connected. They all teach the same principles. The same principle. What we call in Christianity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are all mentioned in different religions. The Jewish religion it speaks about Keter, Chokma, Bina. Keter is the Divine Father. Chokma is the Christ, the Perfect Son. Bina is the Holy Spirit. What about the Hindu religion? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Divine Father is Brahma. Shiva is the Holy Spirit. Vina is, I'm sorry, Brahma, Shiva, Vishnu. Vishnu is the Christ, is the perfect son. You see? So every religion teaches about that. So it's very important that we become more attentive when we study any religion. And we are going to be providing you with a lot of information. So we don't want to make you tired listening to so much information. <coughs> But we want you to understand that Gnosticism is not what people believe it is. It's much more than that. Gnosticism is real science, real science, developing modern, modern, much more modern ways of perceiving reality, the phenomenon of nature, and to understand cosmic law better. Real philosophy is understanding reality. The spirit and matter, both are the divinity. The spirit and matter have a purpose within ourselves and outside of ourselves. What about, you know, uh, again, coming back into the arts? That is a superior kind of art that can contribute to awaken our consciousness, which is the highest purpose of life making our soul grow, expand. And finally, comparative religious studies, learning to have respect for religion. The trouble with people who don't believe in the divinity, you know, do you know what their tragedy? We should learn to respect every point of view. But do you know what happens to them? They just believe, they only believe that God has no reality. They believe. They cannot even prove their point. So believing means nothing. Especially when you believe in the divinity or you don't believe in the divinity, it's something that can be changed overnight. You have a, 
a conflict in your life and the next day you will change. You believe or you don't believe. Gnosticism means, Gnosis means, you know, learning to know God, learning to know reality, learning to know ourselves. Who are we? Who are you? Who am I? That's the most important question in your entire life. So now I'm ready to receive all kinds of questions. Okay, you spoke of cellular, molecular, and atomic. And I have always had a problem in conventional uh, science, of course, and the atomic world is the world of the atom. The cellular world is the world of living organisms. And um, I guess molecules are sort of in between, like uh, a composition of uh, different atoms together will form a molecule. But in Gnostic terms, the meaning is a little bit skewed. Could you explain that? Yeah, you know, essentially, um, we are entering, we are combining here exoteric with esoteric. Exoteric with an X, which is, uh, we could say, is ancient science, ancient science that today have been discarded, like alchemy and Kabbalah. You know, both were given to humanity by angelical beings. And if you want to see the connection with, you know, with what we know, the Bible at the beginning, uh, in the book of Genesis, it speaks about the tree, the two, yeah, the, the two trees that are in paradise in Eden. And the, the two trees are connected underground by their roots. You know, one is the tree of knowledge, good and evil, and the other is the tree of life. Well, in reality, you know, in esoteric language, the tree of knowledge of good and evil is alchemy. Alchemy. An ancient science, you know, uh, we could say physics, you know, chemistry and biology and even psychology are coming, have descended from alchemy. And the tree of life is more complex. It's a studying, you know, it's a studying the spirit. We could say one is studying matter and the other is studying the spirit, and which is more complex. But the, also on the other side, uh, the tree of life is also Kabbalah. And to understand the Bible better, we should all learn alchemy and Kabbalah. We are going to be giving you more and more information in the future about alchemy and Kabbalah. Because both fields have been also twisted by people who don't understand clearly what they are trying to, to share, to teach. That is, that is a real alchemy, a more complete alchemy that we in Gnosticism share with our students, and that is a more complete Kabbalah. Now, when, when we say that, you know, cells and molecules and atomic particles, you know, they are, according to what scientists have been teaching us, they are all connected. I mean, say, they are all organized in a, in, in a certain way. It is true. They are connected, but they also represent, listen to this carefully, different parallel universes, different parallel dimensions. Albert Einstein entered into the fourth dimension because there is another, another element that scientists ignore almost completely. The word ether is an element of nature. The ether is used in operation, you know, to make people who are ill before an operation, then they won't feel any pain or less pain. But in reality, the ether is the element that outside of the planet Earth is the one that commands, you know. But here on Earth, it's also here. <laughs> it's also here camouflaged among many other elements. And that camouflaged element called ether 
is the one that produces the connection between molecules and cells. It's the electromagnetic field that we use for cells, telephones, you know, television, um, telef uh, internet, etc., etc. But we are just beginning to enter into that parallel universe. And, and the situation is, if we now provide more information about, you know, what Gnosticism has been exploring and developing for centuries, for eternities, then, for example, the alchemists were persecuted by the Inquisition. The alchemists were called alchemists because they practiced alchemy. They also practiced Kabbalah and they were persecuted by the Inquisition because according to them, these two ancient sciences were against the divinity, which is absolutely wrong. So to understand then this uh, situation, we should also say that these parallel universes you know, the cellular universe connected is connected with the three dimensions, height, width, and length. But the fourth dimension, you know, is, as, I, as we said, establishes a connection with the, the fourth dimension has four dimensions, not only three. They are the three plus the magnetic field that connects them all to give physicality the strength. You know, and do you know, do we know that we have a body called etheric body or vital body that Russian scientists discovered more than a hundred years ago? And this is the body that gives the physical body the energy, the magnetic field. You know, scientists discovered that more than a hundred years ago with, an, with a camera called the Kirlian camera or something like that. They were taking pictures of a person sleeping. And that person, you see, that person uh, didn't realize that they were taking pictures of him or her. And the camera, when the, when the pictures, you know, were later, you know, released, they discovered two bodies, one floating above the other one. And they said there must be a, a problem with the laboratory. So they take more and more pictures, and after a few years, they realize that in reality, that camera enter, had the power to enter into the fourth dimension. Today, it's being used by the police, by the military, secret services, when they are trying to trap a group of criminals, you know, in a, in a place, in a building, they can see through the walls you know, and they can see the people inside because that camera has entered already the fourth dimension. But they are not completely developed because they, sh they should be able to see more. So that etheric body or vital body, when we are sleeping, levitates above the physical body. And that body in the morning returns to the physical body to impregnate every atomic particle of this physical body, every cell, because they are all connected. It is true they are connected, but on the other side, they represent a perfect organism, which is also different to the others. So there is an etheric body, a perfect replica of the physical body that lives inside the physical body, lives inside the cellular body. What about a molecular body? Did you know that we have a molecular body? Called the astral body by many esoteric schools. Do you know that we have a mental body? So the mind is not, is not the brain. And our scientists are convinced that the brain and, and the mind are the same. The brain is just a case, a rounded case, where thoughts are developed but it's not the mind. You see, the mind is something much higher. It's an, it's an atomic body made of atomic particles. You see, and, this is what, and the universe is also developed the same way. So we need different bodies to move within the different parallel universes or parallel dimensions of space. 
Uh, you talked about awakening consciousness, and uh, I think, uh, myself included in this, the vast majority of people in the world do not know what it's like to have the consciousness awakened, maybe even, won't even understand what that is. What, so the question basically is, what is it like? Uh, you know, what is the experience to have your consciousness awakened? Is there any way that could be explained? Yeah, you know, the word, the word consciousness is coming from Latin conscientia. Conscientia means with science. It means that to awaken our consciousness, we have to be truly scientist. Truly scientist. A truly scientist is the one who knows the laws of the universe and who knows how to apply them properly. So basically, let me give you an example, you know. The universe has been created. Even some people don't believe in the creation, but today more and more people are accepting that. The universe had been created through mathematics and music. So everything is mathematical. And everything moves through the power of music or the power of vibration. The universe vibrates. All atomic particles of the universe vibrate and move around. So essentially now, to understand, you know, science better, we have to understand mathematics and music. This is why Albert Einstein was a very exceptional individual because he was a mathematician, but he was also a musician. Did you know that he was playing violin, classical music in his violin beautifully? He was a truly a true artist. Now, so consciousness means applying science to wake up to reality because when we are subconscious, unconscious or infraconscious, it means that we are sleeping before the eyes of reality. We have eyes and we cannot see. We have ears and we cannot hear. Eyes to see the mathematics of the universe and ears to hear the music of the universe. So this is the problem with the medicine, you know, when people create, create medicine and after three years or five years they have to replace that. It's because mathematically, they are doing an incomplete work. You know, the whole universe is suspended into space, holding each other. Every planet, every solar system, every galaxy is holding within, you know, within each other. Every atomic particle is holding to each other in a perfect mathematical formula. When we lose the balance, it's because we are the ones who create the disaster because we, we are ignorant, we are not scientists enough to be able to understand the mathematical creation and also the, the power of music, the power of vibration. So awakening consciousness means that. It's, it's, it's a scientific situation. It's learning to be scientists ourselves. But that also means we have to learn to awaken our superior senses because we do have superior senses. The five senses are incomplete. The five senses don't perceive reality the way it is. You know that we have seven superior, uh, we have uh, seven endocrine glands which are atrophied. Our entire human race, you know, is in trouble because we have degenerated our human organisms. So through Gnosticism, through Gnosis, we learn because it's our duty to do that. You know, God gave us all the powers of the universe and we are not using them. We are not awakening that possibility within ourselves. So the seven endocrine glands correspond with seven superior senses. Inspiration is one of them. Imagination is another one. Intuition is. Intuition means knowledge without thinking. We don't know how we know. We just know. So we have to learn to awaken the superior senses. What about telepathy? How many times, you know, we are walking on the street and we visualize a friend. We see it clearly before our eye, but the friend is not there. We visualize it and we then we transform that visualization into a thought. Oh, my friend here. 
We walk to the corner of the street and the friend appears mysteriously. I was just thinking in you. Well, that was telepathy. We connected and the other one will say, yes, me too. A, a telepathic connection. That, do we know how to use that? Uh, you know, on our own will. This is the point. Awakening consciousness means learning to develop our human machine in an amazing way. What Mother Nature gave us and also connected with the spirit because the spirit gave us that power, that superior perception of reality. So we have to be grateful to God because God gave us so much and we are not using. We are not using what God is giving us, the power of life, learning to grow spiritually, psychologically. So, and what is blocking us is what we said, the ego, subconsciousness, unconsciousness. So we learn, we learn in Gnosticism to annihilate that subconsciousness, unconsciousness, infraconsciousness. By doing that, we awaken our consciousness. It's like our ignorance has eaten our intelligence. So we have to stop developing our ignorance and to transform that into knowledge. Hunger and thirst for knowledge, the way we used to be when we were children. Then we will become more natural because we're not natural. We believe we are, we're not. We became mechanical. We lost our creativity. And that's connected with love for knowledge, hunger and thirst for knowledge, to awaken our creativity again, to connect spirit and matter in a perfect equilibrium until we can unify both. So this is, you know, probably uh, I can, you know, develop more and more and more the same concept, but I believe that this is important. Learning to annihilate the ego. The Buddhist religion teaches that clearly. They call it Buddhist annihilation. Annihilation of the inferior nature, which is the ego. The me, 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 me. Christianity teaches about the seven deadly sins. All religions teach about the ego. The Jewish speak about David fighting Goliath. David is the soul, the consciousness. Goliath and his legion of demons represent the ego or Satan, with his legions of... The ego is the same Satan of all religions. You know, in Tibet, they call it the psychological aggregates in the Tibetan religion, the Tibetan Buddhism. You know, and in the Hindu religion, they speak about the battles, battles of Lord Arjuna. It means that is, there must be a war a war between light and darkness. Lord Arjuna was a superior being who incarnated the Hindu Christ, that, that means Krishna. Lord Arjuna went into a battlefield, into a war with his own demons. This is what they call, you know, a psychological war or a holy war. The problem is many other religions speak about the holy war and they go and kill physically people, which is wrong. The holy war represents the inner war that we all should have to annihilate our own demons. Because subconsciousness or ego is the same Satan of all religions with his legions of demons. And this is why, you know, Jesus Christ was teaching about that, the seven deadly sins that we have to transform into the seven virtues of the spirit. Or to be more aggressive in, in our, you know, explanation, we could say, how do we transform the animal psychology into a true human psychology, where we care about everyone? When you're a true human, you have learned to love. When you are not, you're not a human, you're a subhuman which is, you know, which is true. People who have learned to love are people who care about everyone. They make a difference. But most of people fall in love with love. People speak about love, but do we really know what is love all about? That love is the same divinity itself. We have to learn to incarnate the divinity by opening, 
opening the door and learning to love so that then the divinity will be able to enter within ourselves. Yeah, well, our next lecture will be evolution, the law of evolution, the mechanical cosmic law called evolution. And we are going to criticize Mr. Darwin because even he is considered a genius. We accept that he was a very unique individual, but on the other side, he was incomplete. So we, the next lecture will be evolution, involution, another cosmic law. And finally, uh, a superior cosmic law, we can call it revolution re or regeneration, which is the way out, the way out of mechanical laws that don't allow us to grow spiritually. Because we said the spirit does not evolve. The spirit or God, the divinity, is not imprisoned within two cosmic laws which are mechanical. The spirit is free. The spirit moves around without any problem. We are imprisoned within ourselves because of our own ego, because of the animal psychology. So my next lecture will be about that, evolution, involution, revolution, or we can also say, instead of evolution, generation, the law of generation, involution, degeneration, and revolution or regeneration. That should be our next one. All the best and thank you very much for listening. Thank you for downloading this podcast. You have been listening to E. Jim G. Ross, a series of lectures. This is lecture number one. Lecture number two is available on the website at rickyradio.com. Thank you very much.